success to me is just like feeling like any work I've created is aligned to my value system. So just feeling like whatever I've put out into the world, I'm like, oh, I'm like, that feels good inside. And I feel like I've made a difference in the world. That That is success to me. Welcome to season two of Making Conversation with me, Grant Bryden. I've been sitting down with some of my favourite artists and thinkers to discuss creativity and life for this fortnightly podcast. For this episode, I spoke to my friend Mire Harper, editorial director, writer, authenticity reader, communications consultant, and the editor of my own book, Life Lessons from Hip Hop. She recently joined me at Levi's House of Strauss in London to talk about going viral with her Instagram post 10 Steps to Non-Optical Allyship in 2020, the role of authenticity reading, how words can be harmful, and working towards a more diverse publishing industry. If you enjoyed this episode, then please subscribe on your preferred podcast provider, and please check out my book, Life Lessons from Hip Hop, which is available now from all good booksellers. I feel like rest is on my mind a lot, just because I feel like I don't know I feel like obviously we've you know had the pandemic and then coming out of it I feel like everyone's almost been on like autopilot and I feel like I've been on autopilot a little bit so I feel like what's on my mind is rest right (laughs) time away from everything and just like leaning into not being stimulated all the time right that's sort of what's on my mind at the moment because you've gone from this time of being in the pandemic and sort of not being although it sounds well be well again being stimulated throughout that whole time and then coming out of that and still essentially like having to do all the things that i was doing before the pandemic so the socializing the being out and about the you know like all of that but then still with the intensity of Mm. everything i was doing in the pandemic so it's like a weird yeah (laughs) it's almost like double do you know what i mean it's almost like double intensity being out of it so now i just want rest yeah (laughs) that's like my goal for 2023 is literally to re- like rest. Do you think it's hard because I guess it definitely felt like during the pandemic and especially around the murder of George Floyd mm-hmm. that you had like a big sort of moment, I guess, which is obviously a difficult time to be having that. But then I suppose does that bring pressure on you to be like, now something's happening and I need to sort of utilise this... Mm this time so it's kind of like it's difficult to rest I guess when yeah yeah yes I know because I'm like I don't if anybody like requires anything of me or anyone expects anything of me I'm gonna just not adhere to that like I'm always gonna choose myself and choose what I want to do if that makes sense yeah so I don't feel I don't feel any pressure per se and even if there's like external expectations or pressure I try not to internalize that so yeah, weirdly, no. I think it's more of a sort of like, uh, am I, I don't know, like sort of like, am I doing well in the areas that I need to be doing in? And like, I'm always kind of worried that if I like slip off that I won't be able to get back on, if that makes sense. So it's sort of just like trying to deal with that, trying to, you know, like take some opportunities, but not take too much so that I'm overwhelmed. But then also remember that, you know, like, I need to rest too kind of thing. It's, yeah. it's that it's that weird thing. But it's, it's interesting you say that because I did like, I did a talk last week and I said when that whole thing happened in 2020, it was probably like, oh, it sounds really weird, but like it was probably like the, like the worst weird thing to happen to me kind of thing. Because like when, you know, when I put out this post on non-optical allyship, it was really basically like a commentary to like white women <laughs> in my industry right. who were like, oh my God, this is so bad, but at least it doesn't happen here. At least there's nothing bad going on here. And I was like looking around my industry, like there are terrible things that happen all the time within this industry. So it was sort of like a little like dig <laughs> right. of what people in the industry could do. And then it just, you know, just kept spiraling and I had no control over it because that's the issue with social media is you can push something out and just mean it to go to someone and it can just end up you know proliferating um but yeah when I was talking about this last week I said like that whole experience actually really was really difficult on my mental health like really like really difficult my mental health and so I feel like I almost like just lean back now from social media and just like engaging and being constantly active and being constantly like 
a voice. I don't I don't ever want to kind of be a voice. That's not that's just not who I am. There's people right. who, you know, are more expert than me, have more like understanding of things like critical race theory and, you know, decolonization and things like that. So I very much have kind of leaned out of that and I just keep on doing what I want to do in the spaces I'm doing, whether that's in publishing or whether that's like you know causes I'm passionate about that I just work on outside of my job and I don't have to let everyone know about it and I don't have to be like front facing with it almost it's mm -hmm. just like I just do this in my life and that's kind of how I get on with things if that makes yeah, sense no, yeah definitely because I read the essay you mm. wrote on passivity yeah, yeah yeah and that's sort of I guess about that time right and mm -hmm. that that kind of experience of like um what's the name of the book that it's in just so it's called oh my god that <laughs> Don't do this to me now. I'm pretty sure it's called How We Come Back Stronger. Yeah. And yeah. it was published by, yeah, the Feminist Book Society. So it's like a whole range of essays. Yeah. Including mine. Yeah. And I think like that essay it talks about, I guess you sort of specifically this moment where you're transitioning from like a phone call with a friend mm. to a Zoom meeting. Yeah. And like how difficult that switches and you don't yeah, get yeah, time yeah. in between to think. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah. I think that is a really good illustration i think of what you were just talking about for people who want to like get into that mindset yeah, maybe yeah. more yeah yeah it's yeah it was yeah it is a weird thing because it's almost like i don't know i feel like almost like there's an expectation <laughs> once you put something out into the ether but i just i just felt like i was like it's just not <laughs> it's just not my vibe but um yeah i guess like with that essay what I was trying to say was like, you know, there are ways to be active, there are ways to be vocal, there are ways to, you know, create change w without it constantly having to almost be like you in the spotlight. Um, but it's just, yeah, it's just, it's just this idea that like, however you lead your life, you just are not passive or like silent in the face of, you know, adversity or in the face of, you know, hate, hostility, but you don't, I don't know, you don't have to be like, you don't have to like promote it or endorse yourself in the process, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that makes yeah. sense to, I suppose, the approach that mm. you've taken, really. Yeah. That's, yeah. I feel like also it's like, how do I word this? Like, I, I like, I worry about, how do I word this? Like, with social media, I worry that like everything kind of becomes commercialized or commodified or even like um, everything is turned into like bite-sized pieces of content and I'm just not I'm not a content creator yeah. <laughs> it's like my worst nightmare like and don't get me wrong there are people you know who create content and they're really active and they're educational and that's great but it's just not for me and like even in terms of like how I want to position myself like when that stuff was going out people were calling me an activist and I was like oh my god that's so offensive to people who like you know are on the front line like sacrificing their livelihoods and their lives every day Whereas like I've put out a post that's resonated with a few people, but mainly has just been shared by people because they've seen people with a blue tick <laughs> share it. Like it, it's not like, yes, it might have had an impact, but then to, to then kind of turn that into me being an activist, I found very like icky and problematic. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, I just feel like, yeah, like I've always just been, you know, doing my thing in the spaces that I want to do. So like, you know, whether that's, you know, uplifting black creatives or black community organizations like that's just something that I've always done from the age of like 16 so to me it's not like revolutionary <laughs> to me it's not groundbreaking it's just like mm. my life yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and my career yeah. so um yeah I think I think I um that's sort of just how I've dealt with that if that yeah, makes sense definitely yeah it's interesting I think because it's like when you talk about that and how that just becomes something that people are just sharing Mm. that post becomes something that people are just sharing and in a lot of cases i guess people share that to absolve themselves of having to do anything yeah but then at the same time sometimes i wonder for example if i'm about to share something that i've seen like that that resonates mm. i almost then don't want to share it because i don't want to look like i'm just doing that to do it but then yeah. at, but then at the same time i think but it is good ultimately i think to sort of use the small audience that i have to to share it with them mm. especially because i think at, at some point i realized that you know 
I live in London and I live around a lot of people who this is second nature to, mm. they know it. But also where I'm from, there's less discussion about that. So actually, you know, it might only really be for like 20, 30 people who are on there who are... Yeah. It, I, th- I think that there is a difficult thing with that stuff of sharing content and knowing whether to do it or not, almost. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, yeah, it is a difficult situation. I mean... I, I guess for so many people, like, I guess it's to me also it's an individual choice. Like, mm. if people want to share it, that's great. And if it resonates with them, that's great. If they also feel like it's going to inform and actively, you know, change the mindset or change the attitudes of people in their circle or in their surroundings, fantastic. But sharing for the sake of sharing, I'm like a bit like, oh, yeah, yeah. What does that mean? And also like. To, uh, obviously I'm not saying that every single thing I share I like go back on a week later and I'm like have I done this like that's not what <laughs> that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not that much of a uh, yeah like I'm not I'm not like an angel do you know what I mean like but I'm I think that there is something in also che- like checking in on yourself and like even with that post I was like I know that there are people who have shared this who have who have genuinely made no changes in their life like you know, like even if it's something min- it's minuscule, like, you know, there's an organization called Kwanda, which is about, you know, putting money back into a- like the African continent. It's like three pounds a month. There will be people who will go and buy prayer every single day, but not think once about like giving to Kwanda. And I'm not saying, you know, that those people are terrible, but I'm also saying like, OK, so w- what have you d- what have you done with the knowledge? Like, are you actively, you know, like thinking about, you know donating? Are you thinking about supporting? Are you thinking about offering your expertise? Are you thinking about doing like anything (laughs) like I think that's that's more the thing to me of like what active changes you're making in your life even if it's yeah even it doesn't have to just be you know material or like tangible it can be you know working on things inside yourself but what it's just that thing of I do wonder what what people actively doing in response to that if that makes sense no for sure and I think like you said before about mental health and how how that I, I do think that there's a few people that I know where during that time they shared something mm. that then blew up sort of out of proportion and yeah. then suddenly they've got, like you did, a, mm-hmm. a, a much bigger following than mm-hmm. you were used to and stuff like that and, and just a lot of eyes on you. But also it's such a tragic time where you're like trying to process something. Yeah. What did that feel like at that time? <laughs> um, Really bad. <laughs> yeah really bad um I think I just did not have capacity I did not have like emotional capacity at the time and for me also it was like for a lot of people it was like a learning moment whereas I felt like for me I was like this is not like a learning it's like a re-traumatizing kind of experience because you know these things have happened like very similar experiences have happened in my family like it's not Mm. it's, it's very close to home so I found it just like just overwhelming um I mean, the one thing I did do is like about two weeks later, I like put out a post being like, <laughs> if you're if you're here for like anti-racist content, you're following the wrong gal. <laughs> like if you're here to expect me to like educate, you're following the wrong person. Like here are people you can follow. And I kind of did put that out and I was like, don't expect anything from me. So I feel like in in that way, I was like almost re- reinforcing myself. Like you don't owe anybody anything. And just because you have an audience doesn't mean you have to capitalize off of it. And it also at the same time, like, if I'm to be really honest, I had friends and family members who were even like, why aren't you capitalizing? And I was like, oh, like, because there were people who were, you know, kind of coming to me from the perspective of like, you have a duty now, you have an audience now. And I'm like, yeah, but you know, I'm not, I'm not an educator. And also like, I don't know these people, I don't owe them anything and I don't owe anything to myself. And then on the other side, I had like, you know, people like, you know, this is an opportunity for you to do well. This is an opportunity for you to grow. And I was like, this isn't like it was like a real yeah. weird thing because I felt like there were lots of like internal pressures from people in my immediate circle even though I'd pushed out that message you do have it in the back of your mind that oh god people might be expecting something from me so yeah it was hard but I just like I think I'm just grateful that I I have like a how do I wear this like I very much know in my gut when I don't want to do something and I just knew I didn't want to like I didn't want to set something up where there was an expectation for me to keep on producing content or to be responsive to every traumatic moment or to be the voice of anything. Like I just didn't want that. And I think just like having, yeah, having that gut instinct of like, I know I don't want to put this out or I know I don't, I just don't even want to be active has just made it easier for me because 
I feel like otherwise you just get in like, yeah, you just get in a rut about things and you just like second guess things and it's just long. It's just yeah. long. It's not for me. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. so I think that's how I've sort of dealt with it. But yeah, at the time it was mentally draining and yeah, emotionally very, very overwhelming. Yeah. 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 And I guess that's, it's different, even though, you know, you know, in your gut, I think mm. it still must be difficult to make that decision because we live in an attention economy where people will do mad stuff to get you know people want to go on a reality show to try and and the aim is to get a social media following so that then they can go do so i guess it's mm. understandable in a way that people around you are saying capitalize off this because it's sort of like what we're socialized to to do almost yeah, yeah it's an odd one um clout is a weird one <laughs> and i even see it now like i don't know i feel like i don't know i just feel like i like grow very tired <laughs> of stuff like uh, but but I think I don't know my way of dealing with it is to just disengage like if 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 stuff annoys me I just mute I'm I use that mute button <laughs> so much I use mute I use block I will literally just block it if something's irritating me like I like the Kardashians were irritating me like three or four years ago I blocked all of the Kardashians <laughs> and, and like my sister was like why have you blocked the Kardashians they don't even know you li- like you're alive and I was like I just don't even want to see their content like I just want to like have my own world on social media so I think I don't know I think that's also like a way of dealing with but yeah like clout is weird I feel like there's a there's like a lot of people want a lot now and that's not a bad thing but I feel like consumerism and just like material like people like materialism is is mad people just want more and more and more and like I feel like it's a very how do I word this like I feel like the expectations now is like everyone wants that you know like marble top white clinical beautiful flat everyone wants the range everyone wants to wear like the new Telfar bag nothing wrong with all of those things but it's like this want economy where we always want more and we see it you know online all the time so we're like oh I'm I like I expect to have that all right I should be living a lifestyle like this and almost because of that I feel like people like well clout is a way of me gaining you know social capital and just like you know getting money like it's I I completely understand it um but yeah, it's mad. It's mad. I don't, I don't know. I really struggle with it. I also am somebody who enjoys a very simple life. Yeah. <laughs> so I also think like I have that blessing in that I don't really want much apart from like a roof over my head and to eat, like maybe go out for dinner a few times a week. Like that's all I want in life. Yeah. So it's very easy, but I can, I can understand why people get trapped in the kind of like clout world. And you know, like even in terms of like, how do I word this? Like with social media, right? It's, it's some sort of like dopamine that's released from, you know, like likes and comments and things like that. So people can also just become very addicted to like that sort of validation. So I understand it's not always about the material. Sometimes it's also like a psychological thing. Um, but I don't know. I don't, I don't really know how people, you know, deal with that. It's a weird yeah. one. Yeah, because I think it's sort of in a sense you pass instead of having to have your internal sense of validation, you can basically give that to social media so mm. that you don't have to deal with it and then you're focusing on what that's given you instead. Yeah, exactly. It's mm. weird. What yeah. was it like when, because you said that that post originally was sort of like aimed at the industry that you're in. Mm-hmm. What was it like then to sort of go back into that industry after that post sort of got so much attention yeah it was weird it was weird um it was weird as well because so like at the time I was like working I was like so you know publishing but like in case people don't like they're publishing companies and then they own like mini companies they're like they're like corporates right like conglomerate kind of corporates and they own published like publishing companies under them and then there are these things called imprints that are like mini brands within so it's like three-pronged right so I was like working in an imprint where it was just me because <laughs> right. my manager had left to go and like head up another company. So it was also weird because I was like, I'm going into work and it's just me. And I didn't have a great title. I had a, like not a great salary at all for what I was doing, um, which was my editorial director's job. Um, and yeah, it was a bit weird because it was like, okay, there's all this happening on the outside. And then I'm like going back to like, you know, working till 2 (laughs) a.m. and also doing freelance on the side so that I can save up money and like 
I it, like my I think I think there was an expectation about like what life I might have <laughs> by that um but yeah I don't know it was a, it was a weird one it was a weird one I feel like people didn't really un- like know it was going on until it was then in vogue and then it somehow like caught wind and then people in my company were like thank you so much for right and I was a bit like okay thank like some people I was like okay it's fine because I know you're always going to be like there for me and there was a lot of like people I had solidarity with and stuff like that but then there were other people I was a bit like oh I don't really know how to receive this it was a bit weird (laughs) right um yeah it's a weird one it's a weird one I feel like I just kind of just carried on with my life I got it's interesting though because like shortly after that maybe like a month after there was like a conversation of like oh we see everything that you're doing so we're now going to promote you and I've always thought like would they have promoted me? I don't know. Like, I don't know. Maybe they would have, but I don't know. I don't think, personally, I don't know if my career trajectory would have moved as fast had I not had that attention. And that's not even in terms of a following. I actually don't think a following matters that much in publishing, but I think it was like access to an audience and access to influential figures and the power that perhaps gave me Mm. in my industry, if that made sense. Yeah. Which is a weird one. Yeah. It's a, yeah. What does that feel like? I don't know. It's weird because like from one angle, I was like, okay, well, I was doing the job. So <laughs> I was definitely like, I, well, in fact, I was doing over the job that they promoted me to. So on the one side, I was like, I'm just getting my dues. But then at the same time, I was like, mm, it, I don't like, it was a weird one of, 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 of that confusion of like, would I have got this if you didn't notice that? Mm. And I don't, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. 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 It's weird. Do you think that also that has put an expectation on you? Like when people meet you in the workspace, are they expecting you to be a certain way just because you happen to post this thing that took off? Absolutely. I find it really weird, actually. Sometimes like, uh, like it gives, it sounds weird, but like it, it gives me the ick where like I've met people and they're like, oh, how do you get so many followers? And I'm like, oh, like that actually makes right. me feel icky because I'm literally like, I lose followers by the day and that is what makes me feel happy because <laughs> I'm just like, okay, now there's no expectation or like I can just go back to being normal and like do my normal stuff. And because like, there's some things I'm like, oh, I don't know if I want to share that because that's like my personal life and I don't want that many people seeing it kind of thing. Like it's, it's, yeah, it's a weird one. But yeah, I don't know. Like in ways it's valuable because it means sometimes people give me a bit more respect or believe that like I'm actually good at what I do, which is weird because I'm like, you should kind of believe I'm good at what I do by my job title yeah and the fact i've been you know like i've not been in this industry for ages but i've been doing what i've been doing for five years i kind of know what i'm doing <laughs> do you know what i mean like i know how to make books but um yeah i don't know it's weird because from the from the one side i'm like i like that you know people do respect me or people do you know see me as knowledgeable or whatever but i wish that they just saw me as that anyway without me needing to put out a post um and um yeah but I don't know it is it is weird because I think sometimes people like come to me wanting some sort of answer and I'm like I really am not able to give that to you I'm not a social media marketer I'm not a content creator and I don't want to be an influencer and I think a lot of people sometimes come to me being like how can I be an influencer how can I be like this and I'm like I'm not that so I don't know why (laughs) I don't know why you're coming to me like I don't know it's yeah it's weird and then I I wonder also then about you know people's um like value system or like if they're I don't know I don't I because then I'm like oh do I want to converse with you if you're just fixated on like online status and online validation like it's a it's a bit of a mind fart yeah (laughs) Yeah. but I suppose even aside from the follower count and stuff like Mm. that I guess you talked about this word activism before and Mm. I guess like do you find that there's a pressure because some people are probably turning up to a meeting and being like well, we're meeting the activist, <laughs> Mire. No, <And> no. <laughs> do you have that at all? Or? Do you know what? No, people you know. Don't. People okay. know. I think sometimes people expect me to like know about certain things. So like, for instance, I don't know, if I'm in any spaces that where, you know, diversity, equity, equality, inclusion, et cetera, mentioned, there might be an expectation that I know about things in that area or if anything sort of aligned to topics like allyship or things like that, there might be an expectation of like, what is your opinion? especially in my old job I would say that like in my old job there were you know certain individuals won't say any names but there were like certain individuals who would like call me up literally to be like was this racist (laughs) and I'd be like do not call me (laughs) just don't like don't call me again (laughs) but like I'm grateful in the position I'm in now and the environment I'm in 
everyone is quite a progressive thinker and they're not sort of about like they're not worried about like appearing a certain way they're just like doing the thing <laughs> right um, they're doing the work basically so i don't feel like where i currently am there's any expectation it's just like if i wanted to offer my opinion it's valid and it's usually afforded a level of respect because they're like oh you know what you've said has resonated with people and and also even prior to that like i was working in dni freelance for two years like i understand stuff about language i understand stuff about you know like I don't know just like DEI from a kind of a wider lens because you know I was working with like a black owned organization I was also working with a kind of um, gender pay gap like organization so the two prongs I had also have like um, yeah have like allowed me to have a bit more of a like more rounded perspective than somebody who's just been in you know the publishing industry so in that way I'm afforded that respect but it's not so much like Ray knows about allyship. What's your like? It's never that, right. which I feel grateful for. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose I thought it'd be interesting to talk about like the role of sort of authenticity reading, mm. because I guess a lot of people won't know that that even exists. Um, what what it what is it? Yeah, like in terms of like the way you see it. What? How would you describe what it is? Yeah, it's a weird one. To me, authenticity reading is checking any sort of written material, whether it's manuscripts, scripts for TV and film, plays, whatever, to make sure that it's, you know, accurate, representative, non-offensive and non-harmful. That's pretty much my stance on it. That's like what I think I do as an authenticity reader. Yeah. Yeah. And how did you like get into that? Like what did you first start? Well, it's actually really random because I was on... So, you know how, like, in the creative industries, there's just, like, groups and chains. <laughs> so I was, like, on this email chain called The Guest List, which was set up by this really great woman, Shani Mears. Um, and The Guest List is essentially just, like, a, G a global Gmail. So I can get up to, like, 50 emails a day from random people being like, does anyone know about a venue? Or, like, there's this opportunity. Like, it's just a, an email chain. Um, and one day an email came out where someone was like, hi, I know that Dorling Kindersley who are a children's publisher are looking for people who have experience of like DEI and um, publishing and at the time I was doing PR for BYP which was the black owned organization I was mentioning which is like a black young professionals network right. which is all about you know connecting black talent to organizations and corporates and then I was also a PR for Catalyst Collective which was about um, basically ending the gender pay gap in the office so I was like oh okay I'm in DNI, and you know I'm also working in publishing I think I was like an assistant at that time and so I got in touch and basically Dorling Kindersley were building an internal guideline for all editors to look at so it was things like how do we talk about race how do we display body image or like different body types in books like how do we talk about religion how do we you know refer to certain groups like for instance like using the word native might be outdated using the word indigenous is preferred like literally that kind of stuff mm. and so i read it gave my advice on it and then just started working more and more with dk they were like do you want to work on this book do you want to work on this book um and some of it was authenticity reading some of it was almost like authenticity writing so like writing history but in a non-harmful way <laughs> um, because a lot of DK's old history books had been like problematic in their descriptions of certain groups so that was sort of how I got into it and then it was almost like word of mouth I don't know how but publishing is like very small so I just started working with more and more organizations institutions publishers um, and yeah that sort of have that's been my trajectory but yeah I love doing it I like out of everything I do like don't get me wrong I love my job <laughs> I want to be my job for years and years and years but I love authenticity reading it's so fun what is it about it that, that because you think is yeah. so that sort of gels with you so well because it's like dissecting stuff so it's like I don't know it's like I think also it's like you know when you read books as a kid so like I read books as a kid like I read so many books as a kid, like I was obsessed and it's like I feel I feel like there's a duty for publishers to make sure that the material they're putting out is representative and accurate and not harmful. And I think probably from reading stuff when I was young that sometimes was harmful. I was like, oh, I really don't ever want anyone <laughs> to have this experience. Whether it's, you know, doing they're doing their sick form, like 
program on business and there's just like no black business women in in the whole module like things like that like those sort of things are just like second nature to me so it's it's very fun for me to like go and look at things and be like this is missing this is missing or you've worded this like slightly inaccurately and just sometimes to like help authors who might be you know well-meaning or trying to be representative but they need like an expert hand it's almost like being a secondary type of editor to just help them make things more authentic or more thoughtfully executed mm. so yeah i just that, i think that's probably why i like it so much yeah yeah because in some ways there's sort of an element of it where i guess you're a consultant and they don't necessarily mm. have to take what your advice is and is that ever mm. has that ever come up is that ever difficult where you make recommendations mm. without having to name any names but where you make <laughs> re recommendations and they're not yeah. taken on board I mean, I don't think there's ever been... Well, this is the hard thing as well of being Authenticity Reader, right? Is that you send it back usually to the editor who then passes it on to the author. Okay. So often it's always like you're left out of the process. You just do it and then you're like, hope they took it on. If not, good luck. Um, there's been occasional times I've been looped in with an author and they've. it's weirdly, it's only like when I've been looped in with an author, it's usually like fiction. So, you know, it might be like a white, author who's like depicted a mixed race character and it might be like I don't know the way she's described you know her hair I'm like that's you know that might be inaccurate or like the way she might accidentally or he she or he might accidentally like lead a character down a certain trope and I'm like okay well that's like that they, they might not have to be like that like I think that's there's there have been times when I've been looped in with authors there but usually especially if it's like non-fiction I'm not really yeah looped in so i kind of just hope for the best and i love the fact that with authenticity readers like usually nothing ever falls back on you you shouldn't really often be named you usually should like sign an nda <laughs> like right. not all the time but there's probably been like three or four occasions i've signed an nda for like very high profile projects that you know <laughs> mm. was like anything could come back on me so yeah with those situations i feel like quite fortunate because i'm like i've offered my input and my expertise if they don't want to take it on like falls back on them yeah if that makes sense and i suppose there's also a limit to your you know they can't expect that you're going to catch everything or that mm -mm. you are like equipped to know everything yeah and i'm yeah happen, so and i'm very specific so like i have sensitivity reading specialisms so predominantly like if it's fiction i will only say like i'm only reading mixed race female characters if it's fiction right so if it's like a, if the book is written in first person from the perspective of a black man or a black woman or a mixed race man i am none of those people like i, I just can't read them and don't get me wrong not all mixed race women are the same but like my lived experiences as a mixed race woman so mm -hmm. it, it's a narrative that i will probably understand well but i think that yeah being just being in my lane and and like addressing certain subjects or addressing certain lived experiences has just meant that like often everything I work on I'm like I've usually caught like the most I can within my lived experience but I'm really explicit about like you know if this is like a fiction book and then there's like a narrative from I don't know a Chinese character I cannot read that character mm. like I'll just be like that's not me and I have been asked to read Chinese characters before I've been asked to read Ugandan characters and I'm like I like it to me I'm like that's if you come to me and ask me for that you're a lazy editor because you can quite clearly see what my specialisms are. And I break it down as well. I'm like, I am Jamaican and German. Like, I understand those lived experiences. I grew up in London. I understand that lived experience. Like, okay, if it's outside of that, try and find someone else. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I think that's probably how I've navigated that quite well. Um, yeah. 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 And it's interesting. I think when I was sort of thinking about this interview and thinking about what you do, and it made us think a lot about the power of words, and especially when you we're talking before and the word harmful keeps coming up and I s mm. suppose a lot of people might think they're just talking about books how <laughs> you know like how can that be harmful but mm. what makes words harmful what makes the way that a book is written harmful mm, that's a good question so many things like yeah, like, so, uh, like, again, <laughs> there's a project I worked on recently. I signed an NDA, so I can't say what it is. But it was about somebody who was high profile, who has been demonised a lot in the media. And, you know, some of the descriptions, I was like, this is a trope around a certain type of lived experience. So, you know, let, I don't know, let's say, like, if we're to go through tropes, for instance, like, 
historically sometime in some bodies of work but not, not in lots but like historically there was a period where almost in every work that depicted let's say like mixed race women the mixed race woman was deemed to be like a Jezebel like <laughs> and there were some tropes of that that was you know entering a work that was being published now there was a like you know there's the trope of the angry black woman if I see that I'm gonna call it out like it's it's these sort of things that essentially are harmful because they they don't allow you to see a person in their entirety and they they essentially caricature a person's like identity and experience which is harmful because essentially it means that you're dehumanizing the person and when you dehumanize a person the impact of that is seen in like every area whether that's you know mixed race girls being more likely to be excluded you know our hair being banned in schools like those those the the tropes have a very real impact in the lives of those people so i i feel like that's what i mean by harmful yeah and yeah it's why words are really important and i mean it's, it's interesting because it's like i feel like especially from the perspective of somebody who read a lot when i was really young i could easily see from a very young age where there were certain tropes about certain people and i could very easily see where, where i was dehumanized or othered for instance like i loved tintin when i was growing up i had every tintin book ever the companions every every, every tintin book i had it i also had tintin in the congo reading that book honestly was a mind fuck because i was like the way that Congolese people were described was literally as like animals with no brain and like, you know, just needing to be tamed by like English or European masters. So that as an experience, like me experiencing that as a child was a, was both othering and dehumanizing because I, I instantly saw, you know, like you, you read that and you kind of are like, oh, like, you know, my ethnic group are like, you, you, you see that as you being inferior. That like, that's a very real harmful experience to have as a child. So. I think that's what I mean by like the the impact of like words on the psyche and on the way that institutions then treat people of a certain group. Like that's the harm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. I've been reading recently about, you know, sort of it's interesting for me because a lot of the fictional characters that I love mm -hmm. and loved growing up, it turns out when I think about it, they're actually all very violent. Mm. And so, you know, like if you read like Bell Hooks talking about Harry Potter, for example, mm -hmm. th there's a there's an element of that that is good can overcome evil via violence. Mm. And and then obviously there's a lot of violence in man. Mm -hmm. And you think about that and you sort of look at the books and you realize like this is, you know, it's everywhere. I mm. I struggle to think of like, fiction that's aimed at men that doesn't involve some sort of physical fight that's a really good point in order to overcome whatever the moral thing is and then also when you look at the good and evil thing as well that's just a perspective isn't it it's like mm. you know i mean in some stuff obviously like it's it's more apparent than others but in a lot of them you could write the same book from the other point of view and actually the hero of that thing is yeah i think of for me like batman mm, yeah how mad is batman in, yeah. in actuality yeah like this character's decided what is right yeah. to him and is therefore going and beating people up and throwing them in an asylum mm -hmm. it, it's yeah it's it's interesting because then when you think about that as you say like the ripple effect of that and how society is and how important words are and even i think fiction specifically because i think when we think about power in words we think a lot about i think we w would automatically think a lot about non-fiction but mm. it's more recently i'm sort of realizing how powerful and impactful fiction is as well absolutely i always think this with marvel films <laughs> Yeah, I like. I'm obsessed with Marvel. Don't get me wrong, but there are there are a, a good few Marvel films where I'm like, I'm being indoctrinated right now, and I'm being told like, what is a certain, I don't know, I don't know how to word this. Like, what is America's idea of right and wrong? Basically, I feel like is often what I get from Marvel films. Yeah, and then you're suddenly like, oh god. <laughs> yeah, it's all very like it's actually very subjective but you're just getting the one lens with yeah. it, which is weird. Yeah. yeah. And then it's difficult because it's like kind of, 
you know, I don't, you don't want to, like, I don't know how you feel about Tintin, but you mm. don't want to completely separate that was a part of your Oh, it was life like, yeah, it was like 10 years of my life. Yeah. <laughs> I was obsessed. I had everything. I'm not kidding. I had everything. But unfortunately, it's really interesting. There's this writer, Johnny Pitts, who like is incredible. He's also mixed race. And he talks about, I think, Tintin as well. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, all us mixed race kids were going through this pain together. But yeah, no, I've I've come to the place where I'm like, I have let it go and it's okay to let it go. I recognize it had an important place in my life. And, you know, it meant a lot to me. It like reinforced my creativity. It made me excited about, you know, exploring the world. Like all those elements were great. But like as an adult, the stakes of what, I don't know how to word this, like the stakes of like how it represented multiple groups of people mean that in my adult life, I'm unfortunately unable to enjoy it. Right. And it's it cannot any longer add value to my life. So I recognize it added value at a certain point but now I have to let it go. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the way I kind of deal with it. Yeah. yeah. I guess everything's different as well in that sense, isn't yeah. it? So it's like, I suppose you can go and enjoy a Marvel film, but also yeah. be critical of what's going on and, and be aware of it and not yeah. have to believe in waving an American flag. Yeah, and <laughs> <laughs> yeah never going to happen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And also I think, you know, like, this is where, how do I word it? Like, this is where... It's easier for me to let something like Tintin go in adulthood because I know I'm not buying the books. Hergé is dead. The the gain or the value, it, it's not it's not it's not the same. If that makes sense. Mm. So, for instance, like you know, if there's an artist who I've listened to for years who has been like accused of something abhorrent and has been charged and like you know there's evidence, whatever, me actively listening to them or supporting them is is kind of more harmful. Do you know what I mean? Like because they they're reaping the benefits of this in real right. time yeah. whereas like me to me it would be more harmful if like me as a publisher was like say for instance if i was a children's publisher and i was to like buy the rights to herge's estate or something and republish them that's more harmful because i'm not engaging with herge or whatever or tintin's works or whatever like it's not it's not this i don't know if it's, it's not mm. the same if that makes sense i know this is like a really a really long-winded way of like wording it but i don't know it's a hard one it's a hard one and even like i, I keep on thinking there's going to be a day when like james bond also gets its comeuppance <laughs> because yeah. i did a sensitivity read of the entire ian fleming catalog and i was like jesus christ this stuff was terrible like it was really terrible so you know like there's there's a lot of like harmful stuff that is still out there but it's been repackaged and repurposed but you know that there is probably going to be a time when we start to really assess these works and be like oh yeah what impact are they having in real time what attitudes are they reinforcing you know if like young boys are buying james bond now i'm really concerned because every single sex scene is a rape scene like it's it's genuine a rape scene so it's like those are the areas where i'm like we have to start having those conversations mm. so yeah and could you say with Tintin, this mm. is becoming a real Tintin podcast. <laughs> it really is. But <laughs> could you, if you were to buy the right, when you were talking about that, yeah. if you were to buy the rights, could you then, depending on what the contract mm. is, make it right and then put it back out? Or do you think that that's not mm. creatively the right thing to do? Well, that's the thing. And ethically as well. So yeah. like this was the issue with James Bond as well. So like, you know, there are things that you you have to take out of James Bond because you can't use the words nowadays. You actually can't. So it's like certain words might have to be asterisk, like with an asterisk to block them out. But like, you like, you know, if I was to say, change the sex scenes to consensual sex, like you, you can't because it's so embedded in the text. Like the whole, the whole body of work is misogynistic in, in its essence, like, mm -hmm. and it's racist in its essence. Like that's how Ian Fleming wrote. That's how Ian Fleming was. So yeah, it was a weird one for me because I was like, I can't, I can't even amend this, you know, without like amending the entire body of text. And to do that is rewriting someone's work, yeah. which is ethically not right. And it also then portrays Ian Fleming as a very progressive, lovely, non-racist, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, yeah, yeah, progressive yeah. feminist author, which he was not. Um, so I think almost like, you know, I actively think that these texts, unfortunately, Sub, like you know if some people are going to disagree with me I think they should be allowed to go out of print I just think that's the way it should work I personally don't even think 
we should I, I like there's texts I just don't think need to be in circulation mm. unless you know maybe like one for reference or something or like it's like put in a central place like the British Library I don't think we need to have them on constant circulation for everybody to read but I know that that's also just not going to happen and I don't have the power yeah. <laughs> to control that so yeah it, I don't know it's a weird one I would like as a publisher I just I'm like I have a responsibility and I'm able to, you know, not make those decisions. But, you know, the wider industry is a whole other kind of mm. body and, and they have power. Yeah. And so do estates. Yeah, so. Yeah. And I yeah. suppose by going back and messing with old stuff, you're portraying these old guys to look sort of squeaky clean when I suppose you yeah. could give that platform to new younger voices who are more genuinely like that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It also makes us think about it's interesting because I suppose with the comics characters mm. because of the format you can actually change this stuff as you go, you know, mm. like the people who originally wrote Spider-Man are not yeah. the people who are writing Spider-Man now and yeah. the people who then make the films and the reboots and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I suppose with those characters you do get the opportunity to keep updating them and stuff. I yeah. guess when I was reading a lot of that stuff i was thinking about you know the early spider-man stuff mm. is like he's quite like an incel type so character cool. who's sort of like <laughs> struggling why does that not to get me? <laughs> women and you know like oh. and and now it's i suppose the relationship that he has on screen feels he's much a cool more, guy yeah, yeah. um <laughs> yeah it's interesting because i suppose with the stuff that we were talking about before Tintin and James Bond, they're much more fixed. Mm. I mean, James Bond, I suppose, isn't in film form. No. As much. Yeah. They could do things to change him, although... Mm. It would they, be so interesting to me, though. Like, this is... Because, you know, there was, like, a conversation around, like, you know, James Bond being black. And I was like... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> having, having read all the books, I was like... <laughs> like, <laughs> that, that kind of... Like, I feel like maybe if, you know, if it was a different agent, but, like, because the, the character of James Bond historically has just been this awful character that i'm like it feels really weird to then have that conversation i don't know like it's just oh i don't know it makes me feel like weird and icky because then i'm like it is that thing i guess of like are we trying to paint these characters as like completely new wonderful people when like historically what they've been built on is really dark and and i struggle with that yeah. a bit but then you're telling me this about spider-man i'm like i never knew this so that's also weird because you know i love spider-man but i wouldn't have known in his early iterations that he was basically an incelly weird type doesn't surprise yeah. me <laughs> well i mean if you think <laughs> about the toby Maguire one even, yeah he was a bit of a loser and that's not like that long ago no um but he did have mary jane so wasn't that much of a weirdo but yeah but that's but yeah. the thing it's it's still i i think it feels like it plays into that fantasy you mm. start this little scientist guy who's like a nerd yeah and he ends up with this woman who's like a model yeah and like you know i think there's something going on there yeah. for the audience that it's for when it's originally coming out. Yeah, There's something true. going on there that's sort of playing up to their fantasy. Yeah. Um, oh, that's weird. Even like it, it also brings to mind sort of like Black Panther and the sort mm. of Chadwick Boseman, the icon that that's become. But, mm. you know, it was started in that era and it was, you know, created by white men. Really? Wow, well, never knew that. But I See? think <laughs> that the learning. thing is, is that it gets to keep being reinvented and like yeah. living a new life. Mm -hmm. and There's yeah. definitely progression from if you if you went back to the source yeah. materials. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what do you think when, you know, when you're looking to publish stuff and what 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 makes a good book now to you or what are you looking for in sort of like published material that, that isn't harmful and that like does mm -hmm. something to progress um well i think where i am really helps so like the imprint i work for bluebird and well i work for bluebird on one boat and bluebird are ethos is you know books that help readers lead happier healthier more connected and delicious lives there's not going to be any bad vibes <laughs> in those you know like the sort of books we publish are like you know someone mental health someone how you deal with trauma like building a happy home, like all of them have a very positive essence to them. And then with One Boat, it's books that help people protect the planet. So <laughs> again, the ethos of like the space I'm publishing into um, means that like most of the books I'm 
trying to find are like trying to make society better but yeah I think I don't know I think to me like so yeah in that in that in that essence like nothing I publish as far as I'm aware is that harmful there will always be people who who will like you know have a comment on what you publish but in my opinion my books aren't harmful and then in terms of like what makes them good or what makes them like what makes me want to publish them is I I don't know I feel like I like books that speak to a social need I like books that like address a topic that I feel lots of people are talking about but like are searching for the answers to and books that that are written by people who are passionate and live by what they're writing about so like for instance you know I mentioned you know the book on relationships that we're publishing in like February by Vex King you know like he he lives by his word like that's the essence of what he talks about self-love loving relationships that kind of thing so it's you know like it's he he's an expert in his field like he's been married for a long time he talks about relationships very openly I'm publishing a book next year on how essentially you support your child's mental health from the age of four to 21. That's written by a consultant child psychologist with over 20 years of experience in lockdown. She held workshops for over 10,000 parents who were on NHS waiting list. Like she lives and breathes what she does. She cares about it and she's an expert and she knows about it. Um, There's a book called To My Sisters that I'm publishing, which is written by two girls who've been friends for over a decade, who have a podcast all about sisterhood, who have created an entire global network all about, you know, accelerating and empowering women and caring about women's wellness and growth. So I feel like everyone I I publish has this like, it's their life's work. It's what is their passion. It's their purpose. It's what they put out there. So it's usually pretty easy (laughs) for me to work out what I want to publish because I feel like, whoever I'm working with it's their life it's it's Mm. like this is just another body of work in their life it's like you know they might be doing courses or workshops or they might be doing therapy or whatever this is just like what they're doing in book form almost Mm. yeah yeah for sure Mm. obviously I haven't been in publishing very long but Mm. from my own experience of going into publishing spaces and stuff I've noticed there's a disparity between sort of when you go into a bookshop, you're sort of like really hit with diversity. You're you're sort of that's what's at the front of the store. Mm -hmm. Here's all these different voices talking about all these different things. Mm. When I go into a into a the office, yeah, Yeah. it's not a diverse space at all. From the offices I've been in and Mm -hmm. the experience that I've had, is there things that are happening to make? the space more accessible to people because i think it also feels like it's a difficult field to find a route into it feels quite closed and yeah almost opaque yeah yeah i mean like so i'm really honest about like how i got into i knew always knew i love books so you know like like i knew at some point well not at some point in my third year i was like i want to get into publishing because i wanted to be a fashion buyer before that and i just failed all the tests i was like okay i need to pivot and then i was like okay i've always loved books gonna get into it but like i'm really honest in terms of saying like the way i got in was my sister's best friend was working as a temp at penguin random house and at the time she was like oh there's this website and on this website had all the editors like email addresses but i'm like if i hadn't had access to that person to tell me how to email you know I don't know how I would have gotten in and like so yeah I think like from a kind of entry point it's quite hard I also don't know if publishing like makes an active job of like being at the entry points for all children so like I think back when I was at Hachette I worked with like Stephen Lawrence Trust and we would go into like schools so we went into like Deptford Green and stuff like that but like Otherwise, I don't know how like year nines, year tens, year elevens would even know the industry was a thing. Like I didn't really know the industry was a thing. Yeah, it's a it's a weird one. It's hard because I think there are a lot of like initiatives, traineeships, programs. There's a lot of like, there's a lot of points for graduates, I would say, or for like you know twenty one year olds. There's a lot of that, but I don't know if there's like a point before that. Do you know what I mean? And like. Uh, th- pay is a barrier you know like when I entered the industry I was on 20,000 to me that was a lot of money (laughs) because I'd Mm. never earned like anything I don't like I was working in retail but like for a lot of people that's not enough um now it's like 24 grand which in this economy is not a lot of money so that's a barrier it's like London centric but then it's weird because it's not 
it's not like London, if that makes sense. Like it's like people, I mean this in the nicest way, but I feel like a lot of publishing is people who've like moved from a shire to London. Mm. <laughs> so it's like a weird type of London centric. It's very middle class. A lot of people have been to the same unis like Oxbridge or Durham or Warwick. Not everyone, but you know, it's, that's right. a lot of people. East Anglia. So again, if you look at the makeup of those universities, it's very reflective of the industry. People hire in their own image. So if you have a lot of white people, they're probably going to be hiring a lot of white people and they're probably going to have the same backgrounds or have been to the same schools, been to the same unis. And then I think even if you do get like further into the industry, like me in my position, I, like, I don't get me wrong, I love my job. I love the company I work for. I think that they are great. But I speak to a lot of people in my position or similar and you get tired you get burnt out you also sometimes just look around and you're like oh it's just me or like there's only like five of us so so it's like I don't know even if you're like in it and even if you're comfortable in your job sometimes it's also just like difficult to like come into work and be like oh I'm the minority like that's actually a really tiring experience to come yeah. in and be like oh I'm the minority and I just feel like sometimes the stakes are higher sometimes like I don't I don't even know if it's like an internalized thing because I don't think it comes from my management. But I think sometimes also being in white majority spaces, you're like, oh, God, I've got to really prove myself. Mm. Like just like I just sometimes think, well, like, you know, they might think I'm just not good enough. Like it's those sort of things that I think can be really hard. And just like the nuances of stuff like, you know, I was even talking to my friend who's like she's white. But we both we both consider ourselves to be like working class in terms of like how we were raised <laughs> and we also talk about like you know and I think this is also like why like race and class are so interlinked when we talk about publishing the the, the main thing also for us is like what we have dealing like almost like what we're dealing with at home and you know the ways that like because publishing is very white middle class often there just won't be the same experiences at home like I, I it's such a weird thing to like explain but it's like <laughs> you know things like attitudes around therapy might not be the same attitudes around caring might not be the same attitudes around like children or partners like the nuances of our experiences are very different right and i feel like that can be a massive factor in like navigating that workspace so it's yeah it's a weird one it's a very long-winded way of me saying like i think that there is like change happening in the industry but i do i think the main issue is retention and that is because i think a culture of belonging is missing. A culture of like nuanced cultural understanding of people's home situations and lives is slightly askew or just not recognized. And I don't know, yeah. And like, yeah, like I guess that's the issue of like when you're a minority, you kind of have to stay there <laughs> to like bring more people in. And, and that can be a really exhausting experience for people who aren't white to be like, I'm going to stay here until there's more of us. It can just be really tiring. And sometimes people just want to dip out. So. It's a it's a yeah. it's a real mixed bag, but I'm I'm you say that and I'm not surprised, but it's it's still disappointing that you know like I entered the industry five years ago. I think there's been a lot of change. I think there's been a lot of great things, but I also observe people of color leaving the publishing industry at a, what I would consider an alarming rate, and I think it is because of those nuances. Mm. And you know, unless you change the culture. Like, and not even the culture in terms of like, you know, faces. I mean, in terms of like attitudes, understanding, and almost like, it's almost like in my mind, you have to almost like destabilize the way the publishing industry is set up, which, you know, like the publishing industry was set up as an elitist, upper class, like <laughs> mechanism for disseminating information. So the way it was set up was literally built on elitism, built on the idea of like, sharing certain views as like rote if that makes sense right so you <laughs> we have to like we have to do a lot of unpicking to be able to even make it what we want it to be yeah and i i think there are great people doing great things but i also see them doing it and it's really tiring yeah so what are some positive things that are happening that mm. we can sort of point people to or Oh, well, loads. We can just shout out in yeah, I mean, loads of individuals. So, Sophia Raquel, I wish shout her out. She's amazing. She set up the Free Books campaign in 2020, which works on, you know, getting books out to anyone who can't access them, whether for financial mobility or otherwise reasons. She doesn't ask anyone to prove anything, she just sends out the books. 
She's partnered with loads of publishers. She also set up a free books festival last year, I believe. I don't know what year we're in. Maybe it was early 2022. Anyway, she set up a free books festival in a now gentrified spot in Peckham, which she essentially like de-gentrified for the free books festival where people could come and just get free books all day and come to talks and no one pays anything, just come in. There's my friend Lamara who works at Murky. She's doing amazing things. Um, Yeah, she's publishing incredible books. There's so many people doing amazing things. You know, there's like, there's Africa Rights Festival, which is an incredible festival, which does what it says on the tin, celebrates African writing on the continent and across the diaspora. There's Words We Write Festival, which is set up by this amazing woman, Leone. She also did it with someone else. But yeah, like they they had like Lena Waithe doing like a class on like script writing. And then they had they have all this stuff going on. And there's like an incubator and creative space for black women and non-binary people um, called Babes in Development, which meet up once every month at bar, at the Barbican. So there's loads of people doing amazing things like both in and outside of the industry and I would also say you know there are loads of people working really hard in their organizations like my friend Hope is the founder of our like black and ethnic minority network within Panmac the work she does is amazing um so yeah there's like there's loads of people doing great stuff inside and out of the indus- outside of the industry I think it's just about people making an executive decision to just like be a bit more broad in what they do. So like like going to these black owned festivals, you know, mm. donating to these organizations, seeing how they can get involved, volunteering, offering their time, reading black authors. Like I think also like a big thing with publishing is like, I feel like this is such a long winded way of saying this and I'm going on a tangent, but I often find that like, you have to get what I call like the white stamp of approval on certain authors. And it's like, if everybody white is like, this book is amazing. Suddenly everyone believes it's amazing. Just believing black editors when they say something's amazing, respecting our opinions, respecting that we know audiences and white consumers actively trying to read more. Like I have friends who, if I said to them, have you read any authors this year who aren't white? Probably would be like, oh shit, no, I haven't. And it's like, why not? Like, and I think, People just need to make more responsible decisions when they're consuming. And it's not just for books. You know, it's like, are you, you know, maybe you should be buying Gaudem's issue or Guap's issue or like maybe you should be signing up to Black Ballad. It's like just expanding, uh, expanding their minds a bit and just like using their buying power to support black creatives, whether that's in books or whether that's in like adjacent industries. Because I kind of feel like that's the that's the only way we kind of move forward is if people aren't so kind of like pigeonholed in what they consume and in what they value. Mm. So, yeah. yeah. So as we <laughs> sort of bring the podcast to a close, I always sort of close out with the same three questions. So what has been the biggest obstacle that you've had to overcome in your career and how do you think that you've managed to sort of overcome it or or in progress of overcoming it? Mm. It's really random, but like getting stuff. (laughs) So like, I don't know. I don't know if I'm like, I'm not saying I'm not intelligent, right? But I I have always felt like I have to work really hard to get stuff. Like I find stuff really confusing generally. Like I will ask my colleagues again and again, like, how do I do this? How do I do this? Five, Five years on. So just, yeah, just getting stuff. I have, I feel like I have to relearn things all the time. How do I get through it? Talking to people, asking for help always. Being like unapologetic, I'm like, I'm really sorry. My my brain is slow. I need this explained to me like four or five more times. And just doing refreshers. Like every single year I do copy editing and proofreading training because I'm terrible at both. I'm still terrible five years on, <laughs> but I just keep on refreshing. Um, so that's that's probably my main obstacle is literally just finding it really hard to understand stuff, especially in the business world. Like, and I think that comes from like growing up in a household where like nobody worked in business. Like my parents worked in public services, so I know public services, and I know like risk assessment, all that kind of stuff. But like, right. you ask me about business, I don't know what you're talking about. It's really hard for me to like get. Yeah. Yeah. What are you most proud of about what you've achieved so far? That's a hard one. Um, I don't know. Anytime I work with an author and their book comes out, 
it just makes me really happy when like you know when like when when well you know when you hold your book and you're like yay <laughs> like that that to me is my biggest pride I literally feel like I've sounds really weird I feel like I'm like a doula <laughs> Right. Or like a midwife. And so when someone has their book, I'm like, we made it. <laughs> we made the baby. Like, that's how I feel about every single book that I publish with an author. Yeah. Yeah. And lastly, <laughs> what does success look like for you? Success to me is just like feeling like any work I've created is aligned to my value system. So just feeling like whatever I've put out into the world, I'm like, oh, I'm like, that feels good inside and I feel like I've made a difference in the world that that is success to me thank you for listening to making conversation with me Grant Bryden featuring Mireille Harper if you like this episode then please be sure to rate comment and subscribe wherever you're listening to podcasts you can read Mireille's work in timelines from black history and this is how we come back stronger and you can check out my book Life Lessons from Hip Hop, which is available now from all good booksellers. Thank you to Levi's for welcoming us into House of Strauss to record, as well as Eroy Chan for the graphic design and John Phonics for the instrumental that I'm talking over right now. You can connect with me on social media at Grant Bryden and Miray at Miray C. Harper on all platforms. Thank you for listening to this season so far, and I hope you enjoyed the holidays. I'll be back in the new year with more episodes.